And now we're moving to uh, the next paper. Uh, Ishil uh, Erel from Ohio State University will present uh, monetary policy transmission through online banks. Well, hello everyone. I'm Michelle Rael. I'm from the Ohio State University and I'm very excited to be here for the first time at ECB in Frankfurt um, and to talk about uh, my paper on monetary policy transmission through online banks. So this is a joint work with Jack Liberson from UC Irvine and also Konstantin Yanelis from Chicago. And I, last but not least, we have Sam Ernest. Uh, he was a pre-doc at Chicago. Now he's joining MIT as a PhD student. So. Um, let me be very upfront about two things. So I am saying monetary policy transmission and there are many aspects of this that we have been discussing in the last two days. I will be focusing on the interest rate pass-through. That's what I will be focusing on. And also about the uh, banks, online banks. Uh, although the session title is non-banks, I will not be talking about non-banks. I will be talking about online banks. These will be regulated banks with only one branch, one administrative branch generally, and fully uh, or mostly concentrating on their operations online, okay? So now that I put this, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, the far front of, uh, of uh, my presentation, you can take your after, uh, you know, lunch nap and I will be talking about the paper. Uh, so, uh, so uh, again, interest rate pass-through is what we are focusing on and it has been uh, shown to be imperfect by many papers. And this is not a full list, but I will be talking about a few papers, uh, mostly about Drexler um, and co like talking about banks' market power um, on the deposit side, when the Fed fund rate uh, cha uh, changes, they do not reflect us on their deposit rates fully. This creates uh, a spread between the Fed funds rate and uh, uh, the rates that the banks charge. Um, and they talk about this deposit um, channel of the monetary policy. Um, so, uh, uh, and Duffy and Krishnamurti talk about the sophistication of the, um, uh, the customers. Uh, they talk about search costs. They talk about the fact that sophisticated, uh, you know, depositors actually end up switching to the money market uh, uh, funds or other investment opportunities, while banks are left with unsophisticated uh, customers or depositors, and they don't really bother to change rates uh, for them. Uh, Sharpstein and Sundaram talk about uh, the market power on the other side, on the loan side, um, and they talk about the fact that uh, you know, banks do not reflect the changes on their loan rates as much because of this. And last but not least, uh, the Kunta and Coulters talk about some human frictions that are complementary to all the effects that we have been discussing. They basically say that we assume that investors or customers or depositors will behave in a certain way. Uh, but uh, they don't in real life, and that can complicate things as well. So what do we do in this paper? Uh, we argue that there should be some other uh, factor that we should think about when we think about uh, interest rate uh, pass-through, and it's the effect of fintech, which has changed commercial uh, uh, you know, banking tremendously, and we believe that it has the potential to impact uh, monetary policy transmission. Um, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about, as I said before, banks that fully or mostly operate online. Uh, they cater to different types of depositors or they do their business in a different way. Um, they certainly increase banking competition. They lower search costs for customers uh, because customers can basically um, you know, uh, move their uh, money online very easily. Uh, and if you think about their business, perhaps uh, instead of competing with traditional brick and mortar banks, they compete more with uh, money market mutual funds. So in this paper, we ask this very simple question. How do online banks respond differently to monetary policy uh, to changes in the federal funds rate in the US? Um, so of course, um, you can guess which empirical setting I'm using. I'm using the, uh, uh, the federal, recent Federal Reserve uh, rate hikes, uh, which started in March of 2022. Uh, when it started, uh, the rates were almost zero, uh, and then over a 
uh, year period till April 2023, the rates increased from zero to 5%. So uh, using a difference in differences approach, I will be comparing the response of online banks uh, with the response of traditional brick and mortar banks to these changes in the Fed funds rate. Uh, I will look at the deposit rates. As I said before, I will be mostly concentrating on the interest rate pass-through, focusing on the deposits. But I will say something about also the deposit inflows and outflows. And also, uh, I will go to the asset side in a very limited way and talk a little bit about the uh, growth in the assets and the rates on the loans as well. Um, so uh, in case I, I do not finish my presentation on time, uh, let me give you a summary of my results. Um, so uh, I find that online banks raise their rates more relative to the traditional banks. They respond to the changes in the Fed funds rate more than banks do. Uh, and we believe that's important because there's a huge growth in online banks, and that's why I'm talking here, uh, arguing that regulators should care about this, uh, or the policymakers should care about this. Uh, we find that a 100 basis points increase in the federal funds rate leads to about 22 to 35 basis points larger increase in the annual percentage yields uh, for online banks relative to the brick and mortar banks. Um, and as a result, uh, not surprisingly, we see a deposit inflow coming into these online banks uh, more or more so than uh, traditional banks. Actually, in traditional banks, we see the outflow. Uh, and we also find, and uh, with limited data, I should say, that mortgages and auto loan rates of online banks are also more sensitive to these rate changes. Okay. So in the interest of time, I will be very brief on the literature. There is a huge literature, as you know, on the monetary policy transmission, talking about different channels, uh, um, you know, uh, using the supply of bank loans, bank capital, communication, perceptions, uh, deposit market power, loan market power, as I already talked about. There are papers that talk about unconventional monetary policy. Uh, there is also huge literature um, um, uh, on fintech, uh, on the development of fintech uh, lending, uh, where I contribute to, actually, uh, where the non-banks are big time, especially in the US, lending in the commercial loan market. Uh, we see increased competition in direct lending uh, to non 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 not only commercial borrowers, but also consumers as well. Uh, and, and this, we believe, increases the um, access to finance. But again, in this paper, I'm not talking about non-banks, but I'm talking about regulated online banks. Um, focusing more on the literature that's more related to my paper, Wang and uh, co-authors quantified the importance of some of the interest rate pass-through channels that I talk about, and uh, I think they provide uh, uh, the importance of the uh, deposit uh, channel uh, that we are being con concentrating on. Uh, Kairang Zhao has a job market paper that looks at the monetary policy transmission through shadow banks. Um, uh, uh, this all is also related to these old papers uh, showing the rigidity of bank deposit rates, uh, going back to Hannan and Berger, 1991. Um, uh, lately, um, uh, you know, uh, with the failure of SVB, um, uh, there, there is a huge literature uh, growing, looking at the run on the banks, and our paper is most related to the paper by Kunt et al., uh, and the quarters. Uh, they show that the introduction of digital platforms, mobile apps, and they concentrate on the large banks uh, with at least 300 uh, reviews on their apps, um, they show that this reduced the franchise value of deposits. Actually, they show that uh, this leads to an outflow of deposits uh, from the banking system while we, sh we will be showing inflows. Okay. So online banking. I keep talking about online banking. I think uh, you know I don't need to convince you that uh, uh, you know the importance of the online banking is there uh, is out there, and some survey uh, evidence shows that uh, nearly 80 percent of the households uh, use online banking services in 2019, uh, uh, and this is similar in Europe as well. But also 80% of these people still go to a bank branch as well. So bank branches are still important for the traditional banks. Uh, uh, but we know that online banking has grown dramatically. 
And what I will be showing you here is that um, if you look at my graph, that's showing you the total deposit growth uh, uh, for online banks with blue and total deposit growth for brick and mortar banks um, in red dotted line. Um, so if you look at this growth between 2001 and um, you know, the current time period, you see that uh, deposit growth for online banks is about 20x, while I'm talking about like, you know, uh, um, about 8x for, for, for traditional um, brick and mortar banks. And uh, we know that when we go through the crisis periods, you know, there is an inflow of deposits to the banking sector. So it's natural that some deposits flew into the traditional banking system. Um, now, so we were expecting this growth, but the growth in online banking is much larger for sure. Um, and of, uh, naturally, popular press has been talking about online banks lately. You know, as a researcher, I would like to see you know, this appearing on the popular press, press as well. So this article is, uh, uh, is talking about LI or Goldman Sachs, Marcus, and also Capital One, they're all in our sample. Okay, our data will be coming from uh, um, mainly RateWatch, where we see the deposit rates. Uh, but we will be augmenting it with various other data sources, call reports, um, you know, and various other data sources. We will be concentrating on um, a set of savings accounts and certificates of deposits. Um, you know, depending on the availability of data, we will be picking uh, our certain products, but the results will be consistent across products. And I will be focusing on a year before and after the interest rate hikes. Um, so how do we identify online banks? Uh, I should say this is a work in progress, and you know uh, we have a new version of the paper with uh, an extended sample. I didn't intentionally share it with my discussant because I hate it when uh, I hate it when it happens to me. Just a week before the discussion, the sample changes, right? Uh, but. Um, uh, Basically, the results are the same. Uh, what we do is that we identify online banks using RateWatch or some prior literature. And today, I will be showing you results with 17 online banks. Um, and here is the list. And you know, the usual suspects are there. Uh, this is all from the US, like LI Bank, Exos Bank. Uh, many of them will have one or two administrative branches. But you will see some of them, like Capital One or CIT Bank, will have more. Uh, and we will be just, you know, keeping them in the, in the general sample, but dropping them for robustness. Uh, and here is my extended sample. This is the new version of the paper where we go to the call reports. Actually, we identify every bank with one uh, administrative branch, and then we hand collect data on whether they operate fully online or not, which doubles up the sample, and the results are uh, totally the same, very robust. Um, so in terms of the theoretical work, we will be following closely the Drexler et al. paper. If you are familiar with the paper, you would know uh, uh, that um, this is how uh, they specify or they write uh, the spread between the Fed funds rate and the deposit rates. M is the key here. M, uh, uh, as a parameter, represents the market power of the bank. What we basically argue is that M would be smaller for online banks. In other words, it would be frictionless to withdraw and transfer funds from them compared to the traditional uh, banks in our sample. Uh, in other words, online bank depositors will be less sticky compared to the uh, uh, depositors of brick and mortar banks. Thus, we would expect online banks to adjust their deposit rates more than the traditional banks do. Okay, uh, going into my uh, empirical specification, I will, as I said, uh, I will compare the rates that the online banks offer with the rates of the brick and mortar banks, and I will be utilizing a difference in differences specification around the shock. This is monthly data. Uh, uh, on the left hand side, I have the annual percentage yield, and I'm looking at um, 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 the effect of um, the, 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 the increased interest rate hikes uh, uh, that started in March of 2022. Uh, and then I will be also uh, including um, month fixed effects and bank fixed effects. And everything I will be showing you will be corrected for clustering of observations at the bank level. 
Um, and also, um, I will be looking at the total deposits. And in many specifications, I will be interacting my post dummy with the federal funds rate to show you uh, results, uh, the economic significance of the results. OK. Before I show you the regression results, uh, let me show you some statistics uh, to compare my brick and mortar banks, which is 4,000 banks in the US, uh, uh, with my 17 or 40, uh, uh, 30, 40 extended sample banks. Um, so if you look at uh, the numbers, you will see that the average uh, brick and mortar bank uh, is much smaller. I'm talking about 5 billion of assets uh, versus about $66 billion uh, of assets for online banks. They are certainly larger, and I will be thinking about that. And this is data from before the interest rate hikes, and you can still see that they offer much larger rates than uh, the brick and mortar banks do. OK, so finally, uh, before I show you the regression results, let me show you some figures. On the left, uh, up here, you see the change in the federal funds rate. Uh, I'm looking at this interest rate hike from almost 0 to 5%. And then you see my uh, different uh, savings and sorts of uh, deposits accounts. Um, uh, again, with blue, you see the reaction of online banks. Uh, with red, uh, dotted line, you see the reaction of brick and roll mortar banks. Uh, before the shock, um, uh, they move very similarly to each other. After the shock, uh, we see an increase in um, uh, rates uh, offered by both types of banks. But you can clearly see that the reaction of online banks uh, is much larger than the reaction of brick and mortar banks, and as a uh, gap uh, in reaction is increasing over time. And to do it uh, more in a more cautious way, here's my difference in different specification, uh, looking at the, um, the coefficient of the uh, post dummy here in the first panel, and then interacted with the federal funds rate in the second panel, looking at everything, showing you everything uh, across different uh, classes of uh, deposit accounts. Um, and you see the coefficients are all positive and statistically significant. If I want to talk about the economic significance, I'm talking about um, uh, about 22 uh, to um, 35 30, uh, percent uh, uh, basis points more increase uh, for online banks compared to brick and mortar banks due to a 1 percent change in the Fed funds rate. Um, I also want to show you the uh, effect dynamically. This is the uh, dynamic diff and diff, or event studies, uh, to show you the parallel trends before, and also to show you how the effect is moving over time. Uh, next, I will show you the coefficient beta uh, with 95% confidence interval. Um, as you see, again, I'm showing you the Fed funds rate here, and then the betas uh, dynamically. Uh, the effect is just increasing over time. Uh, and the difference between the uh, rates offered by online banks and brick and mortar banks eventually reaches to about 2%. If I do this well, uh, deposit weighted, then the, 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 the coefficient gets much more significant eventually, 2 to 2.5%, 2, 2 sometimes 3% difference. Um, and in an extended sample, um, the economic significance increases as well. OK. Uh, so, so far, I convince you that, uh, hopefully, I convince you that online banks respond differently in terms of their uh, rates uh, to the interest rate hikes. Um, a natural uh, consequence of this uh, is that uh, they should attract more depositors. And it's what we will be seeing as well. Actually, this is the figure I showed you in terms of their growth before. Uh, and you could see, actually, that um, they grow a lot. Uh, but I didn't talk about this. Like, after the shock, you see that the growth reverses for traditional banks while it gets much steeper uh, for the online banks. Uh, um, and you might be wondering why I'm not showing you anything about uh, money market mutual funds, because that will be a natural uh, comparison as well. Uh, data is a big issue. Now I'm, I'm showing you some growth for the money market mutual funds, actually as, uh, after the shock, using some quarterly data. Uh, and that's with the uh, uh, green dotted line here. As you see, some of this, these deposits flying away from the dip uh, the traditional banks, they are going to the money market mutual funds, but not as fast as uh, they flow into the online banks. 
Um, so I've been showing you the huge growth in online banks' deposits, uh, but it's a little bit misleading, right? Like, because I'm not showing you the, I can see one of the comments, uh, the uh, total size of uh, the online uh, uh, banking deposits. Uh, if I talk about the total size, actually with my small sample, it's about uh, 5%. But with my extended sample, it will be increasing to 15%. And that's the, the results that the discussant uh, has not seen yet. Um, and here is the total size of the deposits for the brick and mortar banks. I'm talking about reaching to about $15 trillion here um, just before the interest rate hikes and then losing uh, like about uh, $1 trillion afterwards, soon after that. And for online banks, uh, the change in the deposits would be in my small sample again, and this would be just like uh, getting much larger with the extended sample, is about like $200 billion between 219 quarter one to 22 quarter one. And then it continues uh, with the same magnitude um, over a year after, after, after the shock. Okay, just to put these uh, in a regression setting, I'm running the same difference, uh, the different diff specification for total deposits uh, here. Um, and as you see, there is about like a additional $6 billion running into the online banks compared to the uh, brick and mortar banks. And I was relieved to see that it's driven by interest bearing deposits rather than non-interest bearing deposits because uh, this is the uh, part that they, they focus on. Okay, so far I showed you some results. Uh, these are important facts, but what about the mechanism? So what is driving this? You might be arguing that what I'm showing you is uh, most uh, is just like perhaps a competitive effect. So it might be the case that online banking is much more competitive than a, an average traditional banking, and I might be capturing that. I will, I will show you results against this. Or you might be just arguing that uh, they might be having some better investment opportunities around that time, uh, and that's why we see these uh, different reactions, and I will be also showing some evidence against that. What we believe is going on, as I said before, like based on the framework that I also introduced, our biro from Drexler et al. paper, is that um, their depositors are simply different. Um, and uh, the next like, uh, question, whether it's because of the demographics of these depositors, or there is something special about brick and mortar banks as well, uh, meaning uh, special about the relationships with their customers. And I will be arguing that it's not only the demographics, but no banking relationships uh, would be driving some of this as well. Okay, let's look at some results for the mechanisms. So first I will be talking about pass-through and the local bank competition. So with 17 or even like 40 banks in the US, it would be very hard to talk about uh, actually competitive markets for online banks versus not. But I have many banks in my sample and I can definitely concentrate on banks in more competitive markets versus banks in less competitive markets. And it's what I do actually here in the first two panels. I am comparing my online banks with uh, banks that are operating in uh, low, comp uh, uh, low competition areas versus high competition areas. And you might be arguing that online banks, where they operate is not very clear, right? Uh, uh, for that, we look at their advertising efforts and look at where they advertise and also pinpoint to the areas where they focus and concentrate on only those areas in uh, panel D and E. Most probably you cannot see these results, but results are similar in, across every cut based on competition. And we also have some results on um, you know, competition using the deposit betas produced by Drexler and Toll paper and, 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 and no difference there either. In other words, what I'm trying to show you here is that pass-through is different for online banks even in comparison with traditional banks in competitive markets. Uh, moving to the demographics. Some of you might be using online banking. Uh, I assume you are younger and wealthier than a traditional bank customer. That's what the research shows. Uh, 
um, that you know, more educated, younger, and wealthier uh, customers prefer online banking. And it's really hard to rule out uh, the fact that you know, the customers of online banks are different, and that's driving the results. But what we do in the rest of um, uh, the analysis in this part is just to try to see whether this is the only explanation or there's something else going on as well. Here, I'm running my regressions and including interactions with various uh, characteristics of the customers. Unfortunately, we don't have great data at the customer level, and the only thing that we can do here is to use data on the characteristics of the people in certain zip codes that the banks operate. And that will be for my traditional banks. Here I'm looking at um, uh, the characteristics of these people, like whether they have computer access or internet access, whether they are older or more educated, at the zip code level where the banks have branches. And these interactions uh, actually don't change my results at all, or including the interactions of these variables uh, with my online dummy does not change my results. Um, furthermore, uh, I also run the regressions by looking at, uh, by concentrating on, uh, only on traditional banks in zip codes of similar demographics to the online banks, and the results remain robust there as well. Moreover, it's more like a placebo test. Uh, here, what I do is that I, um, instead of using online banks, I just like pick some banks, traditional banks, that operate in areas um, uh, with similar characteristics uh, to the online banking customers. And I don't see the results. So what am I learning here is that, you know, most likely online banks cater to different types of depositors, but it doesn't seem to be the only explanation for the results that I have. Uh, what we believe is that there is something unique about relationships through bank um, offices or cross-selling products or um, you know, relationships that tra traditional banks create for customers on multiple dimensions. We tried to test this uh, uh, by looking at specialized online banks versus more generalized online banks. Specialized meaning that these online banks that sell only one type of product, um, they focus on only one type of product on their asset side a one type of commercial loan, for example, versus an online bank that focuses on multiple types of products. And I find that the results are um, you know, much more stronger uh, for the first category when, when, when the uh, online banks are more specialized in the products that they offer. Uh, Moving on, uh, we do various robustness tests, you know, because these banks are larger than other banks. Uh, they might be younger than other banks. Uh, they might be uh, offering higher rates to start with, so we match based on various characteristics uh, uh, that we talked about, and the results remain robust. Um, so uh, we also run tests, like just to see whether uh, there's any difference in investment opportunities around that time that could be driving the differences between online banks and traditional banks. We look at their uh, ROA in general or ROA in their credit card business or all loans, whether there is any change around the, um, uh, any difference around the shock between the online banks and traditional banks, and we don't see any difference. Uh, Finally, uh, before I mo move on to the last uh, on the asset side, I also want to kind of say that we matched our banks based on the rates that they offer before the shock, in addition to their size and other characteristics to the traditional banks, and run our tests on a match sample instead of comparing like you know 30 online banks with 4,000 you know commercial banks, even in a match sample. I see a significantly uh, larger reaction to the rate hikes of online banks uh, compared to the traditional banks. Okay, in the interest of the time, I will uh, skip the, the rest of the robustness test, uh, test and I will talk a little bit about the comparison to the loan market. So online banks are obviously growing and um, uh, the effects of lowering search costs on the asset side is ambiguous. So it could be the case that more competition will push down the loan rates, or it could be the case that because they are uh, offering higher rates to their depositors, they might be just like charging higher rates to their um, uh, borrowers as well. 
So we run some tests like with only a few banks for which we have um, loan level data. In the extended sample, this increases from three banks to six banks. So please like, you know, uh, know this caveat about the loan uh, results. But we see that uh, there is some increase uh, in the pass through of the federal, uh, Fed funds rate changes onto the borrowers, onto the, uh, onto the, uh, the borrowers on the loan side, meaning that um, uh, the online banks charge relatively hard, uh, larger rates uh, on their borrowers compared to the traditional banks. So in other words, we find that monetary policy pass-through is greater among online banks for both loans and the deposit rates. Uh, this might uh, create some distributional consequences because um, uh, we see that savers benefit, and in this case, savers, savers are wealthier, while the borrowers suffer, and um, would expect these borrowers like you know um, less wealthy, younger uh, borrowers on the asset side. Um, just to wrap up, because I'm out of time, uh, hopefully I convinced you that online banks raise these, their deposits. Uh, uh, much more compared to the traditional banks, and we see the effect on the total deposits and loan rates as well. With that, I would like to thank you, and I'll leave the uh, podium to my discussion. Thank you, Shell, and now Ralph will discuss the paper. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me and letting me discuss this very interesting paper. Even so, uh, I have to uh, ask the organizers next time, please don't let me follow Refet. He's impossible to follow as discussant. Uh, <laughs> uh, with that, uh, let me first do the most important part. When you work at the central bank, say these are only your views and not those of your employer, meaning the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago or anybody in the Federal Reserve System. So, what you have seen, and, and is a, you know, there's a fantastic short, a job in uh, summarizing the paper, so what's going on here? So first, we have a classification of online banks, uh, which is not easy. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. And then we have data on rates of bank savings products, and then we look at do these uh, online banks have a different transmission of monetary policy to bank funding costs, with other words, what you have yes heard yesterday from Laura, right? It's about the beta here. This is about deposit betas. Now, let me briefly pause and say it's like identifying an online bank uh, isn't entirely easy because yesterday Camelia showed you her app and she showed you all the funny uh, things she can do on the app, but since she banks with Citibank, it's, it's irrelevant what she does because uh, this is about banks without branches on a high level. Let's call them banks without branches. So all you, all you can do is, is go online. That's the definition, and that's totally fine. That's consistent with what other people have done, for instance, in the mortgage market when they looked at FinTech and said, like, well, you have to submit your whole application online, and that's our definition of a FinTech. So there's a consistency here across the literature. Um, then we use the most recent uh, monetary policy tightening and show that these interest rates on the saving products across actually all maturities increased much faster than the traditional brick and mortar banks. Uh, also, we see that contrary with the brick and mortar banks that actually lost deposits on average, the online banks actually increased deposits. So they got an inflow. And that is actually really interesting because that is exactly the opposite of what you would expect otherwise, right? So this is, they're, they're not behaving according to our standard, monitor, like our standard bank channel. That's uh, something to note and to further explore in the future how we should think about this, especially when the landscape is going to change and uh, we get more and more of these um, uh, online banks, whether this pattern will still hold up or eventually, you know, there's only so much deposit, so it might also go down. So, and then I call it suggestive evidence on, on path through to loan rates simply because as Ishil disclosed, thank you for being so honest, um, uh, it's a small sample, but I think it's actually important evidence, and I will get back to why I think it's important evidence in a second. So let me just give you the two key findings here. So here's finding number one. You can see 
uh, on the left, the federal funds rate, on the right, the savings products. In the right chart, you see the blue line, the much faster increase in the rates paid by online banks relative to the red line, which are the brick and mortar banks. So you can see two things in the right-hand side chart. First, online banks are more sensitive even at the beginning of the tightening cycle, meaning they actually increase their rates earlier and then they also increase it faster. So keep these two things in mind. The second thing is deposits, right? Traditional banks, left-hand side, lose out deposits. Online banks actually get fairly sharp inflows. Now, that means uh, what? So why do we care about what's going on here? Well, the first thing is, uh, if online banks are more sensitive to monetary policy changes, if they have a higher beta, then uh, monetary policy could, in theory, become more potent through these online banks, right? It, the transmission to funding costs and eventually loan rates, which would then affect consumption, would be more potent. It would go faster and it would be more potent. I think that fast is actually also important because monetary policy, we all know, it operates with the lag, but perhaps now the lag time gets shortened if that is, in fact, what is going on here. Um, what's unclear, and that's something that's not really discussed in the paper, so I just want to mention it because, again, I work in a central bank and we care about financial stability implications, and I think there might be some, and it's not entirely clear which way it goes. In the following sense, right, if you have increased competition for funding and deposits, that could uh, reduce the net interest margin in the whole system, and you already pointed to research that said that the um, deposit franchise value actually go down with the transition to uh, to digital platforms, and that might be problematic. The other thing that could go on is like all, all, online banks could just have a different risk-taking channel of monetary policy, very much in the sense that they actually extend credit to riskier borrowers when brick-and-mortar banks pull back, and thereby offsetting part of this risk-taking channel uh, or de-risking of these brick-and-mortar banks, which would be comparable to the effects of non-banks in these lending markets. So I have a paper uh, with, with uh, David Elliott at the Bank of England and other co-authors uh, that documents this for the US across various markets. And also uh, yesterday, if you have been here by the, in the introduction, there's also a paper here in the network that shows that the same is true uh, in Denmark, where non-banks also substitute for banks more generally in monetary tightening. Okay. So now I want to, before I jump in with, with comments, I just want to raise the point that to fully understand what's going on here, we really, really have to think about what are these online banks actually doing. Now, uh, I didn't copy the full list of banks because I didn't want to bore everybody to death, but let me just highlight a couple of banks that are in there. Uh, so one is a CIT that is actually a huge lease lender. Uh, it's not what you would think about your brick and mortar bank. They do lease financing for, for firms. They're highly specialized. They're good at what they're doing. Uh, there's Ally in the sample. Ally used to be GMAC. You remember that uh, General Motors Acceptance Corporation that blew up during the financial crisis that was saved, incorporated as a bank, is now Ally. And uh, why does that matter? I suspect that um, they might actually have an outsized presence in, in the auto loan market, and you, you can tell me whether that's true, uh, because they inherited the network, um, the auto loan network from, from GMAC. Uh, so they might be very specialized, do something different, may have a different customer base. The last uh, two that I very briefly want to mention is there's E-Trade in there and Schwab, I think, in the new sample too, right? They, they are broker dealers. Uh, so, there are broker dealers that also have a bank, so that you can have your savings and your checking account and then have a brokerage account. I have both at Schwab, so I can tell you this works fantastically. They do have branches only for the broker dealer, not for the bank, but you can do banking in the broker dealer branch. But that's fine. Um, the last, but the point is, they do something also very different. You see, like the theme that I'm kind of trying to get here is like what's, what's lumped together here as online banks. There's a lot of heterogeneity, and I think everything Ishel has told us is very interesting. I just want to push for understanding more the business model because I think that will tell us more about how monetary policy transmission is actually going to be affected. So the last one I'm going to mention is American Express and Discover because they're credit card banks, which again are also going to be very, very different. Okay, so with that, now quibbling. Okay, so my first comment, and 
it goes into the same direction. What are these banks actually doing? is I was actually surprised, right, because the, the competitor would be money market funds, and yes, the pass-through is, is still only half, right? It's, the beta is still 0.5 by the end of the sample period and not one. And if I go online and I search, somehow it must have a preference for a savings product. So it could be this F FDIC insured, I'm not sure, but I couldn't understand why somebody would buy a six-month CD for 2.5% if you can get 5% in a money market fund. Um, so what is it that these online banks offer? So on the, on the right-hand side, I put up a, a screenshot of late where all these online banks are, and currently they are very competitive with the, with the money market funds. So they got there eventually, but they had a, much, they had a delay, and I would also be, just be interested in like what in their business model allows them to do this and getting these inflows, because you, you document these inflows. Then pre-trends. I mean, um, so here I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and say, well, at the zero lower bound, of course you're not going to find pre-trends, right? I mean, that, that would be hard to find. But note that the online banks always paid more, even a couple of basis points before. And I think that's an important observation because that means that there's something going on in the business model that makes them either pay more for whatever reason, because they can, you name it, um, or there are some other feature, perhaps there are new players in the market and Christoph will tell you they want to cross sell products later and so they want to attract deposits now and, and create a relationship or they are riskier banks and they just have to pay more for funding. Like I can tell a couple of stories why that could be true but again, linking back to the theme, I just want to know what these online banks are actually doing. Um, now, the deposits don't have a pre-trend, and I also wondered a little bit what the, uh, sorry, they have a pre-trend. They have a very strange pre-trend in the sense that there was a lot of deposits flowing into the traditional banking system, that's the left-hand side, whereas the right-hand side was flat right before the raise. And why is that? How should, how should we think about this? Like one story I could tell is banks have a lot of deposits, they sit on ton of reserves, they don't know what to do with the money, and they don't raise deposit rates because, well, honestly, they want to get rid of some of these deposits. So perhaps their behavior is different because this is a special episode after QE, banks are flushed with liquidity. They, maybe they, they were totally happy to run off these deposits. I don't think we can fully exclude it. That's a little bit of a problem with basically one, one tightening cycle. Um, and this, whether we can generalize this is TBD. Okay, so now I wanna highlight uh, one thing more, and this is what beta. So one thing that I would have done in the study, quite frankly, is I would drop all the GSIPs because they are special. I mean, JP Morgan Chase doesn't pay anything for deposits, right? I mean, just... <laughs> In fact, when SVP failed, they got all the deposits, right? So, so there's clearly something special about these banks that have explicit guarantees and their funding structure will be very different. And perhaps um, that would not be helpful. The second thing is uh, my, my Dallas and New York Fed colleagues have this very nice working paper on dynamic betas where they show that uh, the betas actually depend on the level of the interest rate. And the argument is very loosely speaking a little bit like this. Um, you know, when the federal funds rate moves 25 basis points and, you know, there's a spread of 25 basis points between the money market fund and your deposit account, you might not care, but with 150 basis points, you might start caring. So that means that the, that the beta changes over the, uh, over the tightening cycle, and it could well be that there's different dynamic betas going on. So the current structure, the way it's estimated, cannot fully capture this. I understand this. Uh, but it might be useful to have a look at this paper and figure out how exactly uh, the dynamism between these two differ because it's also going to affect the relative effective duration of deposits between online banks and brick and mortar banks. And here comes the reference to also the paper yesterday presented by Lara, right? It's about they have different duration gaps then and that will depend on what their business models are going to be. Okay, so... Um, Skip this. So here's another alternative explanation. So here's the bank I haven't picked on, Capital One. Uh, Capital One is, is focused on the high risk or higher risk borrowers. So you can imagine that online banks have a different customer base. Um, it could be that they, 
have these high risk borrowers, again, they could also be new and just get like the residual demand. And they're usually also not the, the, the greatest guys on the lending side, right? To be very clear on the lending side. But what they have in their asset portfolio could make them riskier. And we know that riskier banks have to pay more. So suppose monetary policy tightening hits the borrowers of these online banks particularly hard. Uh, default rates of these borrowers are expected to soar. Uh, these banks will run into trouble. And we know that banks that run into trouble, the first thing that they will do is they will raise deposit rates really fast. And they get an inflow of broker deposits. Uh, that's the study by Martin Puri and Ovier. And they can do this because they are at the FDIC and they have the nice little detailed data to show you this. Um, but that could then also explain the stronger transmission to consumer loan rates in the sense that riskier borrowers, of course, uh, their loan rates will go up faster in the tightening cycle as well, simply because. So this is just one alternative story, which again, I want to link back to my overall point. I think it's great that we have these facts. They are important facts. And I'm pushing for understanding better where the facts are coming from, what precisely is the business model of these banks, and how should we think about it in monetary policy transition. Uh, I have data cripples that I'm going to um, skip simply because I'm out of time. I thought this is a very, very interesting paper. I think it's an important step in understanding the potential impact of the changes in the banking sector on monetary policy transmission. And now I would really also argue, because now you can do this, you have a new sample, to also look what happens around the SVB failure, because it will help you a little bit with the alternative story that I just tried to tell you. So also extending the sample, looking at the crisis uh, around SVB might actually also be particularly useful for us to gain a better understanding what is going on in these online banks. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Raf. Would you like to address the, the comments? Yeah, I, I will be very brief. Thank you so much. This is an excellent discussion. And uh, I mean, this is our aim, right? Like, you know, to start thinking about these banks, you know, um, and that's why I'm here, right? You know, I'm just pointing out to the fact that there's a huge growth. We should care about them. And I, I don't claim that, claim that we fully understand their business model yet. So they are most consumer lending uh, institutions, you know, auto loans, mortgages, uh, and some securities as well, uh, different perhaps from banks that concentrate on commercial lending. And it's important to understand, you know, implications of this, you know, on the asset side. Uh, and uh, we will definitely look at this, VB. Uh, all the comments are very well taken. I mean, now that we have uh, a larger sample of online banks, uh, 30, 40 rather than 17, we can uh, do some um, um, cuts of, of, of that sample as well. Thank you so much. Everything is very well taken. Thank you. And uh, now we have time for questions from the floor, please. Yeah, um, I find it super interesting, of course, to see that the uh, no branch banks have a higher deposit spread better. Beyond the obvious point I have to make that uh, they might be less interested in cross-selling, um, I was wondering whether maturity transformation might differ, right? Um, DSS21, uh, banking on deposits, would make us think that uh, they have a different deposit spread better because the uh, asset maturity is different and I would think if they make auto loans indeed uh, asset maturity might be different from those making mortgages. So it would be interesting to uh, to look at this and, and see if this is one other possible explanation and, and link it. Definitely and, and we thought about that and Maybe. we tried to kind of match based on that to the banks as well and we don't see differences. I mean we match based on rates, we match based on other characteristics. I mean we believe there is definitely something special about like being fully online versus having a branch other than the structure of the banks but but we should definitely uh, include more in the paper on that. Maybe we, we collect the questions and then you answer oh, all together. Yeah. 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 So there was another in the same and then Anz. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this paper. It was very interesting. Um, so I, my question is actually very related to the discussion in the sense that there is this uh, new paper from uh, 
Tyler Muir, and probably, uh, yeah, and, and so basically, UCLA Anderson, but you know it. Uh, uh, um, so basically, they're saying exactly in that line that uh, um, they, in their view, there exist two different groups of banks emerging. One is more uh, low deposit rates, uh, more securities. The other one is higher deposit rates and more loans. Uh, uh, this was like the very shortcut. Uh, so I was wondering how how do you view your paper with respect to their paper? Have you tried to compare? I see that you do very carefully the matching over age uh, and so on. But what about uh, matching with their group of uh, high deposit rate banks? Uh, yeah, thank you. There was another question there. Hi, thanks. No, it's really following up on the discussion of whether it's because these are online banks or because they're different in other dimensions. I wonder if you've tried running some horse races, so you have the online interaction with Post alongside like size and all these other characteristics and see which one survives. Any other questions? Please. Oh, these are great comments. Um, I already an answered the first question about the Tyler Muir and, and, uh, and Coters. Yeah, we did actually match based on, they argue that um, the, the banks differ in terms of, I mean, some banks set higher rates than others. Uh, we match based on the rates as well and the results are there. So um, I encourage them to think about this channel now, you know, now that we have our results matching, uh, you know, the rates as well. And, you know, the interactions with other characteristics, the great idea, we did it for the demographics, but we didn't do for, you know, uh, the other bank characteristics. And we, 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 we did many subsamples, you know, based on rates, um, uh, the age of the bank and the size of the bank. I mean, we, we kick out uh, the large banks, uh, um, you know, uh, at the end, instead of comparing only like, you know, uh, comparing to 4,000 banks, we compare to, we match to five banks based on rates and size and other characteristics and the results are there. Um, there is definitely something special about these online banks, you know, even controlling for other characteristics. Okay, well, I would like to thank again the presenter and the discussant. We are now taking a short coffee break, and I'll see you later. Thank you.